Hey everybody, so today we are going to be doing a crash course in ontology constraints. Now, if you're using a data model, if it's with a property graph and you're using a schema there, these will still work for you. You're just going to implement them in a little bit of a different way than just an ontology if you're not using one. But these are at least some of the common ones from my experience that would be helpful for you to be aware of when you're doing anything in the graph space. So if this sounds interesting to you, let's go get started. All right, so I've scooched over a little bit so we can do some examples here as, as I go through these. So the first thing that we're going to start out with is the directionality. So you do not have to have directionality in a graph, and this would be property graph or triple stores. However, there are some uh, queries or graph ML that really only work if you have directionality in your graph. And so an example of directionality is a mother and a daughter. How are they related? So if you have a generic relationship that doesn't give a lot of context, which is related to, perfectly legitimate, but it doesn't give you a lot to go off of because you don't really know how two individuals are related to each other. You then have to go into more data to figure that out. Um, so that's why you do want to have something more specific. So instead of having mother related to daughter, you could have mother, mother of as your relation, and then to daughter. And that would be directionality because a daughter is not the mother of a mother. That, may, well, I mean, there are some exceptions out there, but that's not normally um, the rule. So that would be directionality, where there would be two different relations, daughter of and mother of, and they would be going in different directions. Now, this is where we also can look into something called domain, because domain is a constraint that says that this relation should only show up when this node is being described. So just keep in mind, there can be multiple domains for specific relations, but they have to make sense and they have to be specific and contextual. So let's take another example. So let's say your graph is focused on uh, architecture and you have a relation height of and you focus on the height of certain buildings. If you add people to height of, now you have two different domains. You have the height of a building and a height of a person. And if you look at this, this helps you understand if you need different relations or if you need to add more context to your data model because can we really see the same exact relationship representing building height and people height? Don't buildings have very, very different heights than people? Well, that's accurate. So you probably do want to have a different relation for both of these types of entities. And the way to make some of these decisions is not only do these have very different ranges, not to be confused with a different thing we're going to talk about later called range. That's why this sometimes gets confusing. Uh, there are different upward bounds and lower bounds of uh, height for a person and for a building. You know those are wildly different, but you also have to think, what are you going to use this data for? If you're using it for data validation and you have uh, 12 foot, is that a person or is that the height of a room? That gets confusing. So um, if you need to validate the answers from an LLM, this is another use case for these ontology constraints. Uh, video down below if you want to check out more about that. But if you get uh, Kevin Bacon is 12 feet tall, you want your AI to be able to check, is that logically accurate according to the rules that I understand for my business case and my use case? And the answer is, um, you know, some, maybe there are some outliers of people that are 12 feet tall or more. Uh, but the general is not that high. And so therefore, to validate that information, you're going to have to split those uh, height uh, relations into two different relations. So you have different domains and you can add even more constraints to it. So you have good data validation. And along those lines, we can talk about min and max. So this is where 
another confusing point might show up in the ontology constraints area. So min and max is a cardinality. So what that means is how many values are legitimate for a specific node to have. So for instance, if you are looking at uh, the height of a person, people grow. <laughs> so there are gonna be different heights for people. And so maybe you have a um, min of one because you need to have at least one valid uh, height for a person. And let's say in your data, you don't wanna ever entertain more than uh, 10 uh, height values. So that individual person node would be related to person height and then they could only have up to 10 values at any given time in your data. And if it goes over that, then it's too many. And so that's how the max would work and how the min would work. So with min, if you have an entity and they do not have a relation of person height with a valid entry for the, the height, then that would be invalid because you are dictating in your use case for your data, you have to have a minimum height for all people. A better example of this is usually birth date. So in, or death date for that matter, uh, a lot of people data, um, you want to have an joined date or birth date or some date to indicate when this person showed up in your systems for some reason or another. And so that's usually a min value constraint. So making sure that every person in your, in your data has that value somewhere. And so that's what the min and the max is for, but that also gets confusing for those that aren't familiar with ontology because sometimes you see min and max and you think it's the value of something. That's actually something that you would have a different relation for, maybe the upper bound or lower bound. I know FIBO has some of those. And then it would be connected to a distinct value. And there you can have some more data constraints because there are some other data validation constraints, but I'm not gonna go over all of those in this video. The next one that a lot of people get confused about is range. So range is something that usually goes hand in hand with conversations about domain and they can get very confusing. So the domain is usually this relation can only show up in these domains or these for these nodes. So as an example, if you had home state as a relationship in your data and all of your customers are from the United States, you yourself are a company in the United States, you may want to consider having instead of any value uh, for the customer home state X, uh, you might want to designate a state node and then you would have to have a node with all the states that are valid to be connected to a customer. So every time you would see a customer node and a home state as a relation, it would have to then pull a value or an instance from the state node because those are the only ones that are valid. This is oftentimes where you see a lot of taxonomies show up. So this could also be something like um, valid uh, departments or geographic uh, sales regions or um, product areas, things that are a usually smaller set list that does not change very often. And these often all have um, downstream applications that depend on them. So. Um, for a customer home state, maybe those customers then get um, funneled to specific salespeople because they have territories for those states. So those are some of the reasons that you might wanna have the constraint of range for states or for department or for a set list that you have in your data. All right, last but not least are the different types of relations that are out there. So this kind of goes into the directionality again, but uh, defining the specific type of directionality. So if you have an asymmetric relation, it means that one node is related to the other node, but the reverse is not accurate, right? So going back to our mother-daughter example, a symmetric relation would be related to, it goes both ways. So you would only need one triple to designate mother related to daughter because it goes both ways. Related to goes both sides. 
Again, you want to be more specific than that because you can miss a lot of data and you don't get as good uh, of results with inferencing if you're using inferencing when you use those more generic uh, relationship types. Now, functional is another type of relation and that is specifying that there is only one node that can be connected with that relationship. Looking at inverse functional, an example of this might be if you have, let's say, a DOI or a other unique identifier. That unique identifier could have a lot of different inputs, right? So it could have different titles, different publication dates, different um, things that go into that DOI or a unique identifier for an article or a book. And it's all still pointing to the same DOI. Getting into transitive, um, a lot of these have social network type of uh, examples or familia, right, family type of relations, biological relations. For example, let's put up a family tree here. So let's say there is a great grandmother of mine and she had two daughters. And let's say um, the daughter that is my grandmother only had one daughter, my mother, and then my mother just had me. Let's look at the other side of that family tree. Let's say the other daughter had uh, the same type of relation, just daughter to mother, daughter to mother. I would be a distant relative of the same child on my level of <laughs> the genetic tree here. So that's usually how it works is if you're looking at a tree structure, anything at those lower levels of the tree, because they all share some distant ancestor, they would then all have transitive relationships to one another. And those are gonna be more general relations like ancestor or biologically related or um, worked with because you know you use these a lot in the social spheres so those are usually transitive and I honestly have not and correct me in the comments if you've seen otherwise I usually see these in things that are um, tree structures so people or accounts or something that has parent child parent child parent child and and that's usually how it, it shows up now reflexive and irreflexive are things that I don't really see use very often. I think that the ones that we've already covered are the ones that are, I see used the most. All right, so that is a crash course in some of the top constraints used in the ontology space. I'm sure I'm missing a few. I'm sure um, there are some favorites or some that are super confusing that I did not cover. If I did miss any, please make sure you leave in a comment below because I would be happy to go through some of those as well. All right, so with all of that said, I wanna thank you very much and I'll catch you next time.